the vaccination uh, podcast. Yeah. We'll revisit that in the please, pediatric Please podcast. stop making us look stupid, Cole. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the 31st episode of the Core Consult RX Podcast. My name is Mike Corvino. With me, as always, Cole Swanson. And we have a special guest, Setu. How is it going? It's going well. Yeah? Yeah. You're this really, is exciting. You excited? Yeah. This is this is probably the big, biggest opportunity of your entire life, right? By far. For sure. Oh, yeah. Nothing can compare. Um, hello, everyone on Instagram. I see uh, Balake. Blake Roche, uh, also uh, supposed to be here today, but instead took vacation, so that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so today, um, before we get started, we're actually going to talk about immunizations, but um, Setu, give us uh, your origin story. What? Uh, how did you come about starting pharmacy school? What was your background? Give us some, some background information. So my journey definitely has been a scenic one. Um, It has been quite some time. I wanted to be in healthcare uh, from the very beginning, uh, but I wasn't quite sure where I uh, belonged. Um, But then after working in a community pharmacy, I realized that I would like to work with patients as a pharmacist, as they are one of the most accessible healthcare professionals, um, and um, just pursued the career um, towards pharmacy. And I couldn't be happier three years later um, well, almost fourth year, um, and couldn't be happier with my decision. Awesome. You know, some say most here. trusted. I think we're we're uh, competing with nurses for that one, but mm. I agree. I think too. I think it really depends on the person. On because who, yeah. like, like on the pharmacist or on the person on who the, is the, the patient. Oh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. I think if you're in community setting, which both of us have had extensive experience in community mm-hmm. settings. I feel like there's the opportunity for patients to really trust you. And there's also for them to assume you're the guy that rings up their toilet paper in the pharmacy and then they go on about their way. Or the reason their drugs are so expensive. Exactly. Yeah. You can also be the culprit in, uh, <laughs> in a scheme to rip them off. So. Yeah, but that's only healthcare professionals. I think firefighters take the cake on just the most trusted people ever. Probably. Yeah. I think that's They're usually like, in better shape than we are, yeah, for sure. That's yeah. unfortunate. But you don't see too many overweight retail pharmacists, do you? Mm, I don't know. I've never done a survey. Can you think of one? Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> should, I we, can't. should we name names? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I I wouldn't say there's a ton, but yeah. Okay. Well, I think Probably, we stay pretty healthy uh, yeah, overall. Yeah. I think we got to stand up a lot, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, sorry, said to you, back to you. <laughs> so, uh, it's just no, we're going to talk about nonsense instead of talking about you. Well, it wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> um, but yeah, people listening are just like, oh, geez. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> um, Fast forward. No worries. <laughs> Hit that skip um, so, button. So, yeah, it's definitely been an interesting journey uh, for uh, me. And having been a student at MUSC, I could definitely say that there has been a lot of opportunity that. I've um, had a chance to discover. And so I definitely would be, um, I'm very proud to be the future pharmacist and learning from the best over here. Um, so. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Cole is very charming. <laughs> <laughs> She's clearly talking about Mike. So you're going into your fourth year. What's, uh, what's the plan afterwards? Um, at this point, I would like to follow general PGY1 awesome. um, as a path. And, um, but you know, we will see what uh, there are things sure. to happen. Awesome. Well, cool. So, um, you know, kind of going back even before, you know, you said you've always kind of had a passion. Um, we've talked a lot about, you know, chemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a biochem major. You were a, just a regular chemistry major. Those are like the <laughs> special eight, like the special forces of science majors because chemistry is a rough way to spend four years. Um, do you feel like that part of it like doing the organic and the inorganic chemistry physical chemistry those kind of things like kind of steered you still towards uh pharmacy or did you ever consider doing like phd work like research no i don't think um i would have wanted to do phd there was like one semester that i thought about maybe um when i was doing lab um 
research but then i realized that that's not for me uh, and so i'm a people person for sure yeah and it's, more power to those guys because um yeah to me it doesn't seem like the most exciting thing but they're the reasons we have vaccinations right yeah, yeah. For, so sure. PhDs. for sure for sure yeah I, I i strangely really am interested in that i don't know that i could do it for very long and it's very i think counterintuitive to my personality and stuff but there's i don't know i feel like it would be kind of cool to be like in a lab and like working on drug research i think doing research sounds awesome i think that the day-to-day is probably very mundane just like most yeah. most jobs you know yeah. just kind of do the same thing over and over but and hey. plus i think i would lose my mind if like i had spent like months working on a part like a project and then i got like negative results right. or Didn't get something funded. screwed up fda said no oh that'd be awful and next thing you know i'm just like throwing <laughs> stuff around the lab and just causing a, a huge God. scene <laughs> and i'm kicked out i gotta start right. all over <laughs> well med school now <laughs> wanted to do that in the first place <laughs> But now that's definitely uh, chemistry. For those of you who are thinking about going in the medical field, um, chemistry, biochemistry, um, you know, are definitely, in my opinion, the ways to go. Because I think biology is one that, um, you know, a lot of people end up going with. But uh, I think biochemistry and chemistry is is a little bit more challenging. And it really prepares you for what you're going to kind of encounter, just as far as a lifestyle. Um, where you just, you know, you have no fun and you don't get to see your friends anymore and you just completely dedicated to school. Um, at least that was my experience in undergrad. So I think <laughs> that was a nice kind of uh, segue into pharmacy school for me personally anyway. Yeah. Do you agree, Satu? I would totally agree with yeah. that. Advice I, for undergrad students. I'll keep going. Um, I would totally agree with that. So my first degree was in chemistry and then second one was in biology. And chemistry, I found it a lot more challenging though i mean there were different aspects of biology that i have learned that definitely has helped me in pharmacy school yeah for sure y'all are so cool with your what, fancy what undergrad you, degrees you and stuff. <laughs> i didn't get an undergrad degree so here's the thing about cole cole's 12 <laughs> basically <laughs> and uh he got his doctorate really bef- just based on prereqs getting into pharmacy school so he's one of the last people i've heard of that get to actually do that it's pretty well impressive. i mean I, I, I didn't even have a major actually it was an interest is what they called it interest. pre-pharmacy interest yeah i have an interest in tv yeah <laughs> could well, i have gotten in with that i don't know <laughs> it worked out somehow yeah. i'm here and i'm no that's that's doing impressive. pharmacy things so I, that was that's one thing that uh I think you're seeing less and less of um, is people being able to get in because it's so competitive now that when you actually see someone who just breezed through undergrad and got right into pharmacy school without even finishing their bachelor's, that's pretty impressive. So it is. I'm definitely glad I had the opportunity because it's, it's the way to go Yeah, if, if you can, for sure. Yeah. Plus, you know, you're not even mid twenties yet and yeah. you're making a pharmacist salary. That must be nice. Yeah. Not too bad. Yeah. Can't complain. I feel like I'd get myself in trouble back then <laughs> if I had gone back to my 24 year old self. I'm getting married, so there's no time to yeah, get in trouble. She won't let you. Right. All right. So we're going to talk vaccinations. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to stick to adult, um, ACIP schedule, CDC schedule. Thankfully. Um, yeah. And, uh, we're, we're, we'll cover pediatrics at some point, but I think adult immunization is probably going to be more practical for most of the people listening. Mm-hmm. So we'll stick with that. Yeah. Child's a little more niche in which yeah. I guess we'll touch on some that you could get as children, but if you didn't, then you can follow up and catch up as adults. Although it is, I forget the exact statistic, but around 60% of all adults at one point in their life were children who needed vaccines. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's event space. Said so too, just like, what are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's only 60? Yeah, I don't know. at least Maybe 65. I misread that. <laughs> yeah, maybe. All right, sorry. Said so too, we're getting serious now. <laughs> I'm going get to our, get our clinical minds right. So uh, let's start off with flu. Mm -hmm. So we did an entire flu vaccine uh, podcast, I guess influenza vaccine. It was, um, it was it was influenza in general. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when it was it February or something like that? It was that? the end of the last nasty of last year, which was a nasty flu season. Yeah. It hit really late, and so it was probably late February when we recorded that. Yeah. But it's got a lot of good information about flu, about the vaccines, about concerns with the vaccines. We'll go over it a little bit today, but definitely uh, refer back to that one since we're coming up on flu season. Yeah. And if you get to say something about the Spanish flu. <laughs> and you hear a certain statistic, maybe if, if it sounds like it killed, I think it wasn't the Spanish flu. I think it was the um, oh, what was it? The swine flu. I think if if I mentioned that it killed a hundred million people, <laughs> take that with a grain of salt. Okay. Yeah, he didn't think it through before he said it. <laughs> oh man, I missed, a, it, missed we, a couple zeros. And we never realized that we actually said it until like three podcasts later. <laughs> we were listening back. And we're like, wait a minute. That's what we get for not editing stuff. Yeah, so we just make corrections eight months later. Eight months later. So here you go. There it is. 
But um, yeah, so you know, everyone should get a flu vaccine. It's kind of at this point, it, it's starting to catch on. There's not as many people that are, um, you know, rejecting the fact that they need a flu vaccine, especially when, like last year, we had such a bad season. Um, so you know, just to kind of save time going forward, I think the the big thing to kind of discuss is patients that are 65 and over, because mm-hmm. that's where there's there's some discrepancy. Yeah. Um, as far as the actual uh, scheduling. And yeah, obviously they have a higher risk because, uh, you know, they're, as we get older, our immune systems are not as effective, unfortunately. Um, but we need to make sure that we're, we're giving them um, the, the best vaccine that we can, according to the evidence. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if this upcoming season we started hearing things about people being reluctant to getting it because of last year, because mm-hmm. a lot of people who got it still got the flu. Yeah. And it was a nasty one because usually the flu will, it's dangerous for kids and then older adults, like over 65, or people with special health conditions. But last year it was like killing people in their 20s and stuff, which it means it's it's no good. So yeah. uh, definitely important to get, but you might get some pushback this year. And, you know, I mean, last year, I can't remember what we were throwing around, but it was like in the 30s, right, as far as percentage yeah, effectiveness. it was low. Um, but maybe this year will be better. Hopefully. Yeah. So, okay, so if you look at the actual CDC guidelines, ACIP, um, they don't typically recommend a, a certain vaccine for patients who are 65 and over. Uh, now, that may change soon, um, but if you, if you kind of look at the data, we can use that to kind of come up with our own clinical judgment. So this is more my opinion. Um, I would I'm assuming Cole's opinion and some other clinicians' opinion as well. Um, however, it's not you know necessarily backed by the CDC or anything like that. But we'll go through some of the data real quick. Um, so the the three different vaccines, and and, and again, the reason why the ACIP or CDC doesn't uh, rec- make a recommendation is because they want patients to get it. Right. Um, and you'll see the number needed treats that we'll talk about. Um, it's fairly high, and so the m- important thing is making sure these patients actually get the vaccine. Right, because it's, so. good, it's good to know what we're about to talk about, but really a lot of times you are um, hindered by whatever contract your pharmacy or clinic has right. to get these vaccines. So that's what you're going to have to give. It's not like you're going to say, no, I'm not going to give this one because it's not as effective as this other one, but uh, it's right. good to keep in mind. So, you know, you can give a, p- a patient who's 65 and over just a regular trivalent, quadrivalent vaccine, just the same one you'd give everyone else, a standard flu vaccine. Uh, we also have two that are currently approved for patients that are 65 and over. So we have flu zone high dose, which is just four times the amount of antigen that's in a regular flu zone. And regular flu, flu zone is the trivalent. Yeah. Right. Um, and then we have Fluod, um, which is a trivalent uh, vaccine that has an adjuvant added to it. Um, they use something called a squalene emulsion. Um, we did a post on Instagram for Shark Week because some of the places that they get for uh, or some one of the sources that they attain the squalene from is, is uh, shark cartilage. And so we, we, one of my... Uh, former students and, and buddies, Blake, um, who's in our Instagram feed right now, um, was saying that uh, he made a post and about Shark Week because we want to save the sharks. But um, <laughs> fl- Fluad is... Uh, Don't con- get Fluad. Yeah, it's, the sharks. it's considered, uh, you know, the way they were advertising it is it's more immunogenic uh, because of this adjuvant that was added on to it. Um, but the data is not really there. So when they compared it directly to a trivalent vaccine... There was no difference in outcomes. It was non-inferior. So it's just as good, um, but there's a little bit more inf- um, injection site reactions and uh, a little bit more adverse effects. So it's probably better just to give the regular flu vaccine, in my opinion, just based on the, the studies. Um, now, the flu zone high dose, that one has been compared also to regular uh, flu vaccine. Um, and that one w- was actually statistically better. So I think this study came out in 2014. It doesn't have a cool name or anything, so it's hard to um, you know remember. But um, it's, it's something that was compared, and it was because it was statistically significant, they were able to calculate number needed to treat, um, which was 218. Uh, so, you know, 218 sounds like a pretty high number, um, but they did a cost um, effectiveness analysis and it was actually better to give flu zone high dose from a cost perspective since Medicare is paying for it um, and these uh, 65 and over patients. And it's something that, uh, you know, o- over the course of the general population, you know, it doesn't may not sound like much, but if you can prevent a hospitalization, um, you know, from influenza and prevent, you know, potentially death even, um, you know, obviously that's extrapolating, but um, it's it's worth 
treating those people when it's not that much more expensive. I was going to say, I mean, if you're talking about two, uh, number to treat of 218, it might not matter if we're talking about some orphan disease state, but we're talking about the flu shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not even sure how many people generally get it, but um, it's going to be a lot. So yeah. 218 can actually make a difference. Right. So, yeah. And then everybody else, just whatever flu vaccine you have in stock, um, you know, they, they have most of them are very similar. They have like flu block, which right. is the most expensive. That's the recombinant um, flu vaccine to... You know, they don't really worry too much about egg allergies anymore. Right. But, but if you if have a... They put it on there. So what would if a patient said they had an egg allergy? Uh, you can give any of the vaccines as long as it's just a, you know, like a like a rash or something like that. Now, if it was true, like anaphylaxis, you probably want to probably, reevaluate. And... You can still give. I, I believe you actually can still give the regular vaccine, but they want you to do it in a clinic setting okay. where the patient can be monitored. But yeah. the safest option would be flu block. Gotcha. Like a true egg allergy. Flu block. There is also a nasal formulation flu mist, which um, was not recommended last year. And as far as I know, it's not going to be recommended this so year. So there, I believe actually they're bringing it back this oh my year. Gosh, I know. Really? I, I've I heard so, I haven't I haven't officially saw that. Um, I keep meaning to look that up, but yeah, as far as I know, they are bringing that back. I got the nasal uh, version once when I was a kid. I was probably twelve. It was awful. Yeah. Was so uncomfortable. I would much rather get a needle stuck in my arm. Mm-hmm. For, for sure. sure. Yeah. They, uh, I actually have, the company sent me um, demo devices to practice when I was teaching the new grads mm-hmm. um, how to administer vaccines. Just they had to go through the course again. And uh, I, so I, the first year that I did it, we still had the live vaccine. And then right as I got these in the mail, they said we weren't going to carry it that far. So I didn't really need to teach right. it that first year. But I had ordered five boxes, which I thought was like, you know, 25 samples. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, no, no. It was five boxes that each contained like 10 boxes of five. <laughs> so I have, I literally have the world's biggest supply of demo oh, device. Of a useless demo device. a useless demo device. It's just, and, well, I, and I can't bring myself to throw it away because I like demo devices. Well maybe, so well, maybe it's coming back. If it so comes it back, I'll get to actually spray some people with was worth the placebo. On <laughs> just squirt it in their face. So, Yeah. That's for making me hang on to this for all these years. <laughs> we should also mention, we've talked way too long about flu because there's a whole bunch of other vaccines to talk no about. No such thing as too long. I know. I'm just kidding. I know. <laughs> Either way, um, less than six months is the only time that age is going to be a contraindication. Um, and I think that the flu mist, doesn't it have a different age cutoff? I'd have I'd, to look. I, have I to haven't even looked at the guidelines for flu Yeah, we're not going to worry about that unless it ends up coming back. But yeah. um, also, if you have a history of like Guillain-Barre, or something like that, then you may want to discuss with your doctor, you know, pros and cons, because that is a fascinating disease, which might deserve its own podcast at some time, but um, they don't really know why it happens. Mm-hmm. It just happens to some people, your body starts attacking your nerves, and just kind of a the result of getting a needle stuck in your arm. So yeah, it's, it's not weird. great. It's crazy. All right, so what next? Where do you want to go? Um, we could do tetanus. All right, let's, let's do down. tetanus. So this is another one that you are uh, commonly going to get when you're younger. Um, as adults, you're usually getting the booster. Um, and it is recommended that every 10 years you get the tetanus and diphtheria booster. Um, and we should mention there's multiple different formulations. There's the Tdap, which is tetanus, diphtheria, um, and pertussis vaccines. There's also DTAP, which has a little higher concentration of diphtheria little lower concentration of tetanus and that's what they generally will give a child then there's just the td which is tetanus and diphtheria um and pertussis is whooping cough a lot of times patients will get that if um say they're a grand or a new grandparent or even a new parent and they haven't had the booster in a while um i think children less than two months can't get the um i have to double check that don't don't take me on that i'm pretty sure it's two months Sorry, say that again. I was... I'm pretty sure children less than two months can't get the whooping cough vaccine, and so they're high risk for somebody transmitting whooping cough to yeah, them. Yeah, and I would I would have to look at the exact time. Yeah, I, me too. I haven't. I never deal with this. Is pediatrics. the adult vaccination uh, podcast? Yeah. We'll revisit that. And the please, pediatric please stop podcast. making us look stupid, Cole. <laughs> Either it's way, that's why they that's why they would get that because it's uh, if a child gets whooping cough, most of the time it's transmitted from a caregiver like a grandparent or a babysitter. Yeah. Um, the other thing that, you know, as far as Tdap, um, they recommend one Tdap with every pregnancy for a female. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something that really throws, I think some people off is, you know, if you have a, and I had this with, um, 
that I actually experienced where we had a female uh, who was a technician of mine at the time and she was pregnant and so she got a Tdap and then she had some complications later on in the pregnancy and, and unfortunately lost the baby. So mm. then she got pregnant again very soon after and so she came to get another Tdap but it was... I want to say it was less than a year apart. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, the big, so there was a couple of people questioning whether or not we should actually give it. Um, they don't give a time frame as far as when you need to separate them when it comes to pregnancy. They say with every pregnancy, um, I believe it's within the 27 to 32 week mark, they want you to give uh, a Tdap. Um, and so they don't, they don't specifically specify if like you've had one recently, um, now it's been less than a year and you're ready to get another one. They don't say that you have to wait a certain amount of time. Um, but that is something that can be a little weird because we don't normally think about giving vaccines that close together. Right. Um, and if, you know, the patient, uh, who's, if someone's pregnant, you would definitely want to encourage the, the grandparents, anyone who's going to be in close proximity to the, the newborn um, to get Tdap as well. Um, but they only have to get one dose technically. So if you one first grandchild, you get a dose of Tdap, you're not going to come back with the next pregnancy and get another one. The grandparents are good. It's the, the mother so that she can pass on those antibodies to the baby. Right. And I did just verify. So you start the D, D-TAP um, dosing, initial dosing as a two-month-old, two, four, and six months. So before that would be when they're high risk for um, acquiring pertussis. Gotcha. And tetanus. So tetanus in there, you'll frequently hear if somebody steps on a nail and they're going to the ER to get it you know, uh, stitched up or something, they'll say, well, did you get your tetanus shot? Um, and that's because frequently that's where the bacteria that causes tetanus is, it's clostridium tetani. Um, and basically it's a bacterial disease that'll cause painful tightening of muscles often associated with a lock jaw. Um, it can be kind of nasty. So mm-hmm. that's why they want that. And so one of the big questions is, you know, you get Tdap technically once, right? Um, you have Dtap when you're a child, then you get Tdap when you're an adult. Um, and then they want you to get the tetanus booster every 10 years or so. Um, so the big question is, okay, now I have a tetanus booster, but I don't, most people don't have TD. At least a lot of the pharmacies don't typically stock it. Um, and so in that case, it is okay to get another Tdap. It's not going to cause um, any you know, problems or anything like that. Um, and in fact, if the patient actually has a wound, um, then it depends on whether or not it's a, a clean wound or a, what they would consider like a dirty wound um, and how long you have to actually wait to get the vaccine. Um, but, you know, it's something that you can, if it's a clean wound and you've had less than three doses, they say to go ahead and still give Tdap or a tetanus boost or whatever's available. Um, and then if it's, if it's something that's a, you know, like a dirty wound kind of thing, and they've had three or more doses, you probably um, don't have to give one. But if it's been more than five years, you even then could give another, another like a fourth dose of the vaccine. It's not going to cause problems. Um, and if, if, you know, as far as what they would consider like a dirty wound, contaminated, anything with dirt, feces, soil, saliva, um, but they say puncture wounds, um, uh, wounds. This is actually a quote from the CDC's Pink Book. Uh, wounds resulting from missiles. So <laughs> everyone needs to write that down. If you ever get hit with a missile, you need to go make sure you go get a Tdap. But uh, yeah, things that are more a little bit more serious, um, you can actually get more than even more than three if it's been more than five years since the third one. Missile. They must mean projectile, right? I mean, <laughs> there's no, there's no little asterisk like <laughs> see below for more information. I mean, I would love to throw a dart at you and say I'm throwing a missile at you, but there's no way they mean. I feel like they would just say dart. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. I, yeah, I don't know. So I'm, I'm going to Hawaii in a month and they had that whole uh, missile scare. Do you remember that a few months uh, ago? Yeah. So, hmm. So, I need a Tdap booster. Yeah, call me. I'll get you Tdap. I'll fly one over to you. <laughs> there you go. And there's a uh, there's a few brand names for these vaccines. Uh, there's a bunch actually. Common ones that I would see were are uh, Boostrix is common, and also Adacel. I think I've seen Kenrix before too. But uh, yeah. Here's a fun fact: if it's a person that is 65 and over, do not give them Adacel. Adacel is an adolescent. is only approved until 64 and younger. Um, Boostrix is the one that is approved for 65 and over. So it's technically like a misfill or an incorrect immunization given if you give Adacil. Mm. One of my first weeks as a pharmacist, I 
was elected to call the patients and inform them that this one pharmacy had given the wrong vaccine, which I didn't, of, I didn't do it. And they had done a bunch of Adacel vaccines. Like that, and I had to give, I had to call these people and be like, Hey, I'm totally not the one that did it, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not my fault. Yeah. So don't get mad at me. However, you do need to probably come in here and get it another one technically. <laughs> so yeah, make sure you do know the difference between the two. Interesting. You don't forget that kind of stuff. No. It was really nice to do that to the, the new guy. <laughs> I like to throw the the tough stuff on the new grads. Yeah. All right. Um, where should we go? We want to do pneumonia. Let's do pneumonia. All right. This is a fun one. Pneumonia is pneumonia is a little hard. Um, I think there's a lot of confusions because they've changed the scheduling of it a mm-hmm. lot. I've said too. I want you to jump in anytime you want. Okay. Okay. All right. Interrupt me anytime. Because no, pe- believe me, people are tired of hearing me talk. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, 20,000 hours of our voices. I know. That's that's right. For yeah, Another side note, uh, we hit 20,000 hours, uh, 20,000 downloads um, on the podcast. Just on SoundCloud uh, is what, so it doesn't include like Spotify and some of the others. So iHeartRadio, iTunes. Yeah. Oh, I guess, well, I think it might I, include. iTunes may be included okay, in that. Okay, yeah, it might be included. I don't know. That. Either but way. But that blows my mind. So 20,000. So thanks, guys. Yeah, really appreciate it. And now they're probably turning us off because we're going <laughs> off topic again. But uh, yeah, so... Um, really appreciate all the support, but anyways, back to the program, um, Prevnar and Pneumovax. Those are the two big pneumonia vaccines, right? Said to, that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, the confusion is, is, you know, kind of when do we give which one and the schedules have changed a little bit, um, and definitely are a little confusing. Yeah. Which disease states indicate you for what, at what age? Exactly. Yeah. So let's start. Let's start with the actually. Let's start with the very basics. So, PPSV twenty three, Pneumovax twenty three, is a polysaccharide vaccine, and then PCV thirteen, you know, Prevnar thirteen, is a conjugate vaccine. Mm-hmm. So let's talk real quick. I guess kind of the differences between the two, because some people are not aware that there's even a difference. Um, a polysaccharide vaccine. If you think about you know, how your body makes a resp- uh, response to like, a, let's say a normal bacteria, so a normal strep pneumo, it, uh, it you know, may bump into a strep pneumo with a, uh, the B lymphocytes, the antibodies that are hanging off of a B lymphocyte, um, may recognize that polysaccharide coat, uh, and then it would engulf the bacteria. Um, it may be a dendritic cell um, that it would engulf the bacteria, it's some sort of an antigen presenting cell, break up that bacteria take bits and pieces of it and then present it on its cell surface. So it binds with major histocompatibility complex two, um, binds it on the, or presents it on the cell surface, and that's going to activate your T cells. So your helper T's, uh, the killer T, CD4, CD8. And when you have that activation, you get a really strong immune response because you're making memory B cells. If it, if it was a B cell that ran into it, um, and you know, activated B cells, which are plasma cells, and then you have all your T cells as well. Um, but what a polysaccharide vaccine does, a pneumovax, uh, is just the polysaccharide outer coat. And so B lymphocytes may bump into it and uh, recognize the outer coat, uh, pull in that polysaccharide, make lots of memory B cells um, so that it has a better chance of bumping into it later on. Uh, however, there's nothing for it to actually present on its cell surface, and so it doesn't get T cells uh, activated. Um, one of they they refer to if you look at like up to date they refer to Pneumovax 23 as the T cell independent mm-hmm. vaccine. Um, so what a conjugate vaccine did the Pre, the Prevnar 13 they took that polysaccharide coat and they conjugated carrier proteins to the coat, which in that case they used diphtheria because we have a really strong immune response to diphtheria. Um, they took that and they um, conjugated those carrier proteins so that now when your body your antigen presenting cells um, B lymphocytes, dendritic cells, whatever, will bind to those. It'll bring in that those carrier proteins, present those in the cell surface, and get T cells activated. So you actually have a more a stronger immune response whenever you have a conjugate vaccine versus a polysaccharide vaccine. Right. And so that's the that's the difference. So the 23 and 13, I think, throws some people off because wouldn't it make sense to give right. more serotypes? Uh, first, and then a conjugate vaccine that has the 13. But right. the conjugate really kind of primes the immune system with those T and B lymphocytes. Um, and then when you give the polysaccharide vaccine that has 23 serotypes, then you're able to get a little bit better immune response. That's kind of how it works in theory anyway. Right. And so 
over 65, that's usually how it would work in a regular patient. You would get Prevnar first, and then you would follow up with PPSV23. Under 65, though, it gets a little more complicated, and it depends on patient's disease states. Right. So not everyone who's below 65 actually would qualify for the conjugate vaccine. Right. Other than, like, the pediatric vaccine that you already get. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about an adult or, I guess, patients over two years old. Yeah. And, well, and I think the actual guidelines will say, like, 19 to 64, right. that adult age range. The only ones that actually qualify for Prevnar 13 would be patients that have some sort of a immunocompromised condition. So HIV, mm -hmm. um, patients with leukemia, lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, um, you know, sickle solid cell. organ transplant, sickle cell, um, and then patients who just have like a cerebrospinal fluid leak, cochlear implants, mm -hmm. um, things like that. So Think even if you're not immunocompromised, but you have um, CSF leak or cochlear implant, then mm -hmm. you're still indicated for pcv 13 below 65 there's a really nice table on the cdc.gov website um, that the acip has uh, that you can actually see who's indicated for which vaccine and when um, so check that out if you're not familiar with it but one of the big i guess misconceptions is uh, copd mm -hmm. patients automatically assume they should be getting both vaccines if they have copd which actually is not a indication for getting uh, prevnar 13 before you turn 65 um, now, Pneumovax 23, you can get before 65 if you have some sort of a condition, whether it's uh, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, um, even alcoholism, liver disease, cigarette smoking, any of those types of things, or any of the other immunocompromised conditions. I was going to say, so cigarette smoking indicates you, but COPD itself doesn't. But is that what you're saying? No. So if you have lung disease or cigarette smoking, you can get P PPSV 23 Early. Okay. before you turn... Right. 65, um, 65. Yeah. but that's the only vaccine you'd get. You wouldn't get Prevnar. Until you're after over 65. Right. Yep. So patient turns 65, let's say they have COPD, they are supposed to get Prevnar first when they turn 65, and then they can get a second dose of PPSV23, um, and sometimes a third dose, depending on how many they, how many they got when they were younger. Mm -hmm. You can get a max of three. Um, you would get a second or third dose of PPSV23 Pneumovax um, one year after Prevnar, um, is the ideal time to wait. Right. Um, and the reason... And that's, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. The reason for that is because that's usually when Medicare will pay for it. Right. It's a year after. Exactly. Yeah, they'll only pay for it um, once a year. And if it wasn't, if it didn't matter, if price wasn't an issue, you could get it, I think it's eight weeks, right? After. Yes. So the younger patients who are immunocompromised, that they stick with eight weeks because theirs is not a billing issue. Right. So if it's, say, someone who's 25 who has HIV, gets diagnosed with HIV, they would get Prevnar 13. Eight weeks later, they would get Pneumovax 23. Right. Five years later from there, they would get Pneumovax 23 again because you have to wait five years in between PPSV 23. And then that, they could potentially get a third dose of PPSV23 when they turn 65. Right. Uh, but they would only get PCV13 Prevnar one time. Yep. So I know it gets a little bit confusing, but I would definitely encourage you to check out the CDC's website and so you can actually see it instead of just listening to yeah, us talk about it. If there's ever confusion, just check out the charts and they make it they make it pretty clear. I yeah. Think. For sure. Yeah. And, and I mean, obviously, you, it makes sense why someone under 65 who's immunocompromised would need this vaccine. Because uh, strep pneumo and the different serotypes, they're very high risk for pneumonia, higher risk for um, sepsis because of that, or even meningitis. So this all goes into trying to prevent or lower their risk of those sorts of things. Yeah. All right. Anything? Oh, let's uh, let's talk real quick about the recommendation that they put out for patients getting Prevnar, sure. sixty-five and over, because this is always the the spiel I give with. You know, knowing having the importance of knowing how to do statistics and being able to look at literature and analyze it yourself. Um, so the study that came out that really was the the reason why the ACIP, uh, ACIP changed their guidelines was the CAPITA trial. Um, the CAPITA trial showed a benefit to getting um, a Prevnar 13, and then you know, you know for anyone who's 65, based regardless of conditions ahead of time um so anyone who's 65 and over gets this prednar 13 um and they said that you had this big reduction in um pneumonia and then also uh they let me I'll actually pull the abstract they said a that's the wrong one 
I don't have it in front of me. Never mind. Um, they they said that you also got a big reduction. I want to say it was in the 70% was what they um, said, like 72, 79, something like that, um, percent reduction in uh, invasive pneumococcal disease. And so when you look at that, you're like, wow, that's really impressive. <laughs> that's great. Let's definitely give everyone uh, Prevnar 13 who's 65. A um, couple things to consider with this trial is that they included 80,000 patients so that right off the bat is a little weird because mm-hmm. it's very rare to need that many patients to meet power. Um, also, you they did this study in the Netherlands um, because patients over there never have had any sort of pneumonia vaccine. They don't they don't vaccinate their children for pneumonia, um, and then the P, I guess the PPSV twenty three wasn't available at the time. Um, so these patients had never been exposed to a pneumonia vaccine. Period. Um, and then when the, you look at what they actually reported, those percentages that seemed great, um, that was a relative risk reduction, which is only kind of referencing those particular patients in the study. It doesn't mm-hmm. give you a outlook on the whole population. Um, so if you do the math yourself and you take the number that was in the, uh, the, the treatment group, the Prevnar group, the number that was in the placebo group, and look at the incidence of pneumonia, and then actually do the math yourself to calculate risk and then calculate the absolute risk reduction, right. which is what we need. You know, that's the important one. Um, it was very low. Um, the number needed to treat was actually over 1,000. Mm-hmm. So we have to treat 1,000 patients with Prevnar 13, which is not cheap, um, and Medicare pays for it. So you know, we have to you know, have Medicare, another cost burden on Medicare, paying for this vaccine that after you know over a thousand patients had to be treated with this to prevent one case of community acquired pneumonia that may be able to be treated with a ZPAC. Um, and then as far as n- invasive pneumococcal disease, it was over two thousand mm-hmm. was the number needed to treat. So um, not a huge fan of uh, that <laughs> recommendation. But um, not reg- to say it doesn't work, but yeah, obviously, yeah, and, and and not taking into account like you know immunocompromised things like that. That's a whole different right. But ball just game. general population. General population. I don't know that I wouldn't be surprised if that maybe gets changed later on. Um, they were supposed to reevaluate it, I think, this year. So I don't know where that is on the docket. But, anyways, that's my little rant. Um, the the takeaway from that is to it is important to be able to do just the statistics on your own and, and be able to evaluate some of this literature so that you don't get uh, duped. Right. Think about it critically because they were looking at uh, comparing it to the already high risk patients and not really to the general population. And a sidebar about that Netherlands uh, issue um, is that Im- vaccinations, immunizations are probably, I mean, one of the most incredible things that we have done. Um, and it's really been in the last couple of centuries. Um, in other countries, we're, we're talking about American recommendations, right, and American vaccinations. Um, some of these that we're talking about have more or less been eradicated for 10, 20, or 30 years or more because of our vaccinations. But in a lot of other countries, it's not eradicated. Um, and so you may say, well, why vaccinate my kid if this isn't even around anymore? Um, because it can still be transmitted. It's still around. It's just in America, we've more or less um, taken it out. But Right. That isn't to say that um, someone else couldn't get it. These vaccinations still aren't 100 percent effective. Most are in the 90s um, for the, like our childhood vaccinations, but uh, still important to vaccinate your kids. And I think there was a outbreak of like 300 cases of I think measles in California mm-hmm. a couple months ago. So it still pops up here and there. So it's uh, definitely important. Yep. All right, so two. Where do you want to go now? What should we do? Um, we can talk about Zoster. Shingles? Yeah, let's talk about shingles. Let's do it. Yeah. So, what do you think about shingles? Say to Shingrix is the way to go. Shingrix is the way to go. Y'all been doing a lot. Are you out? I guess. Yes, okay. we're out. Yeah. We, um, I think, administered a few last week, but unfortunately. But they're more or less on no. back order for the most part. Yeah. That's because it's pretty popular, right? Yeah. It is popular. So. Before we had Shingrix, right, we only had Zostavax, mm-hmm. the live vaccine. Um, that got recommended by the CDC, ACIP, from the shingles prevention study. Um, and y- the data was very um, 
subpar. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we had, uh, when you looked at all of the patients together, you know, you had a decreased incidence of shingles by about 51%. Um, but the problem is, is the efficacy really decreased over time. And so patients that were 80 years and older, uh, you were looking at about 18% reduction in shingles. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that you did see like a decrease in post hepatic neuralgia um, and, you know, things like that. But it was it was definitely one that as the patients got over uh, or older, rather, um, it wasn't very um, wasn't very effective. Which is what a lot of people say is the worst part about shingles is the time after and that post hepatic neuralgia, which um, is also the only thing that gabapentin is FDA approved for. Hmm. It's a little fun fact. But yeah, so they had that. The Zostavax was live. Um, the new Shingrix is not live. Zostavax was one dose. The new Shingrix is two dose. It's a two dose series. Um, you get the first and then you get the second about two to six months later. Um, but Mike can talk a little more about the data in the Zoe trials, but uh, much more effective and much uh, better long term efficacy, especially compared to Zostavax, right? Yeah. So. I mean, they haven't been compared head to head, but right. but if you're just looking, um, if you're at looking at the rates. data subjectively, you know mm-hmm. the the Zoe 50 trial was looking at patients 50 and over. Um, you know they they showed a decrease in shingles by I think it was 97.7 percent. Um, and then when they looked at Zoe 70, which was just patients who were 70 and up, you still had a reduction of about 90 percent. So much more effective. It wasn't a live vaccine, so we didn't have to worry as much about you know, the, whether or not the patient was, you know, on certain medications, um, had been on steroids for a while, was immunocompromised. immunocompromised. Now, that being said, it's still not officially recommended, um, unless it has been that I haven't seen, but it's not officially recommended for um, the new shingles vaccine. It's not recommended for patients who are currently immunocompromised, um, but they are looking into that. I, I can't imagine that would be a problem. Um, it's, so, I think um, they have to get the data. So what I'm seeing on CDC, it's not specifically recommended in pregnancy, weakened immune system, or HIV, um, but people with poor kidney function, which they kind of group into those immunocompromised. It seems like it is recommended. Um, Asplenia, also diabetes, chronic liver disease. So some disease states, yes. Some disease states, not yet. Yeah. Um, And we should mention the live vaccines that you'll commonly see in adults, um, which you won't see anymore, of course, Zostavax. Um, and the um, flu mist are the two you're probably not going to see much, but those are live. MMR uh, is also live, as well as varicella, which you should get as a, a child, but you can do catch-up um, uh, schedules as an adult, and those you obviously want to um, avoid in pregnancy, patients with a weakened immune system, um, and certain HIV patients. Uh, it kind of depends on their CD4 counts. So you would just want to consult your doctor before giving them one of those yeah definitely if it's below 200 cd4 yeah. you'd wouldn't want you'd want to stay away from which it. would be aids at that point yeah right? uh, and, and patients also you know that are on glucocorticoids so if we think about prednisone or one of the equivalents of prednisone dosing if a patient is receiving 20 like greater than 20 milligrams a day for greater than 14 days we are, they are considered immunocompromised um in regards to a live vaccine. Right. So you'd have to look and see uh, what the patient has been on. If they've been on five milligrams of prednisone for like a month, that's that's different. That's right. not immunocompromised. They have to be greater than 20 for greater than 14 days, those two, two things. Um, but also, you know, there's other things like methotrexate. If they're on, um, you'd want a patient to be on a um, dose of less than 0.4 milligrams per kilogram per week. Um, before they could, uh, or they, if a patient was going to be on um, a dose like that, then you would want to hold off because they're considered immunocompromised. Is it uh, azathioprine, mercaptopurine, th- drugs like that that we'll see every once in a while still? Um, you need to be aware that it could cause some immunocompromised um, conditions. And then definitely like all the new TNF alphas and other biologics we'd want to stay away from. But not all monoclonal antibodies that's the other thing i got a question about that at one it's been a while now but somebody w- was on uh prolia i believe oh really um and asked me osteoporosis if, and yeah and asked me if they could get zostavax on prolia but prolia is not contraindicated um, just because it's a monoclonal antibody doesn't mean it's right. actually causing an immunosuppression right so um just in case anyone ever has that come up good to know all right 
Um, but so yes, the CDC is now recommending Shingrix, which is a two dose vaccine. Mm -hmm. Um, you get the first dose and then you get the second one two to four or excuse me, two to six months later. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you do miss like the second vaccine, you don't have to like start the series over. Um, you just would take it again. Uh, you just get the second one whenever you could After get After the it. six months. Yeah. Um, you don't have to start it over. And uh, if you just have gotten Zostavax for some reason, uh, you would have to wait at least four weeks before you could get the Shingrix. Mm -hmm. But there shouldn't be any issue getting Zost I mean, getting the uh, Shingrix with the flu vaccine at the same time. Mm. Not that I've seen. Right. Some may recommend waiting a couple weeks. Um, if you've heard that and there's data to back that up, then okay. But... Not that we're familiar with. Yeah. Maybe just so you don't get a bunch of, you know, arm pain at the same time. Yeah. All right. Anything else with Zosta? I think that's it. It's a good one. Go out and get it when it's back in stock. Which some places have it, but yeah. frequently it's um, tough to get. Which kind of stinks for the people coming back for their second dose. It does, yeah. They're And that's why I said it's important to let them know they don't have to start it over. Because I think they're freaking right. out a little bit about that. Right. All right. What are the ones we not talked about? Set two. Um, Hep B. Hep B. Yeah. All right. You do hepatitis. Yeah. So Hep B. Um, there's two different uh, hepatitis vaccines for adults, um, and the newest one is. Um, I had the thing pulled up right here. Hang on one second. It's um, Hep Slava, I believe, is the name of it. If I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, I totally lost my place on my sheet, but um, that's the newest version. That's a two dose series. There's also a three dose that's been out for um, quite a while. Um, there are seen to be as you know equivalents kind of thing that the ACIP recommends that you can get the new one if you want. Um, there was some concern that I've that I've seen because one of the trials that had the new vaccine, um, you know, they got it approved. They did see a statistical significance in, increase in MI. Um, and then some, um, like rheumatoid type, uh, reactions, um, which was kind of interesting. It was only in one of the trials, but, um, and the MI was in one of the trials. I think the other, um, autoimmune type is issues were in two other trials, but the, uh, the MI was definitely something that's a little concerning. Um, definitely would want more data on that as we kind of go forward. But, uh, if you are going to, give somebody one of the vaccines then you know know that the older one is three doses the newer one is two and um patients that would be a candidate for this vaccine um you know patients that are um, checking their blood sugar for the, because of the diabetes anything mm -hmm. that subjects them to the to blood um they're going on hemodialysis that would be important um and then also patients that have like liver disease um if they have lfts that are greater than twice the upper limit of normal they want them to get the vaccine. That's the newest recommendation. And the uh, Hep B vaccine is pretty interesting because it's not one of those that is just standard recommendation across the board. There's no specific age cutoff, but like Mike mentioned, there's a few disease states that you should get it. Um, weakened immune system is also one where they want you to get it. Uh, functional asplenia and sickle cell disease, all three of those, you should definitely have a Hep B vaccine. Yeah. Um, if the patient ha needs Hep A, vaccine for like going out of the country um sometimes they need hep a and hep b mm -hmm. um, there is twinrix um, which is the combination uh, vaccine that's only a two-dose series so hep a is a two-dose series um twinrix is actually a special formulation of b so that uh it can be taken in two doses um the if someone let's say is leaving the country and they have to get one dose of hep a and then the second dose six months later they don't have to time that right um and you know they can get the first dose they're considered about 95 percent um immune response at that point with the first dose so they can go on their trip um we'll see that patients that are doing like medical missions things like that over mm -hmm. in africa um they will get the one dose of hep a and then just get the second dose when they come back right you don't have to time it so you can just get that first one and go ahead and go. Yeah. So that's something that I think throws a lot of people off as well. Right. And other formulations. So yeah, Hep Heplosov B was the one um, you were talking about, but there's also Ingrix B, mm -hmm. Recombivax HB, and then the um, Twinrix. Yeah. So that's, uh, hepatitis is definitely one you don't see a ton of, but we definitely no. see it every once in a while. And the Hep A's would be Havrix mm -hmm. um, and Vecta. Just make sure that Havrix is the adult strength. 
Because there's kids and adults trying, so right. you got to make sure you get there's the, the right one. There's the 0.5 mil for the 1 through 18, and then there's the 1 mil dose, 19 and older. Yeah. Both two-dose series. Uh, what else have we not talked about? So I'm, I'm, we don't have to go too in-depth on them, but like we mentioned, there are some that you would probably get as a child, um, but you can catch up as an adult if you need to. MMR, varicella, um, and then HPV. I think that's a pretty interesting one that uh, we could go through. Yeah. Um, but it is recommended um, for women. It's also recommended for men up to age 21, and it's recommended for women up to age 26. Uh, but that's the human papillomavirus vaccine, um, also known as genital warts. And the main reason um, is because it can decrease your risk for ovarian cancer down the road. Uh, and that's uh, pretty significant and you know, one of the few things we have that can actually decrease rates of cancer. So that's good. Absolutely. I think go to cell nine is the only one currently available. Mm -hmm. Yep. Gave one the other day. Did you? Yeah. Nice. Se second dose. We used to have Cervex and then regular Gardasil, but I think Cervex has been off the market now, and yeah. then Gardasil is, I'm sure, off the market as well. It's the newest one. Yeah. Gardasil 9 covers the most stereotypes. What else? Uh, the uh, meningi meningiococcal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Those. Set yeah. two with the save. <laughs> so uh, what about that one, Set two? Anything, any thoughts on meningococcal vaccines that come to your top of your head? Um. It's something that was recommended for pharmacy school. Yeah, there you it go. Is. <laughs> yes, and it's commonly recommended um, if you're going off to college, too. So mm -hmm. if you're going to stay in a dorm and around people. Yeah, um, barracks if you're in the military. Yeah. So, um, um, barracks. I thought you. Were, I thought that was... It sounds like a name of a vaccine. Barracks. barracks. It is. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> barracks for the military. <laughs> so um, one of the things that's interesting about the meningococcal is, is late... I think it was either late last year or early, early this year... Um, it is because we used to give it every five years, the conjugate vaccine to people who had like um, asplenia, um, other conditions that I think maybe even sickle cell as well. Um, but it is now added for patients with HIV. Uh, it's an indication to get it every five years. Mm -hmm. So it's normally just like a, uh, a series that you get once in your life and you're done. But um, if you have one of those immunocompromised conditions, um, asplenia and HIV specifically, the ones I always think of, um, you're getting it every five years. Um, they also, because there's two different, two different types. meningococcal, the regular serogroups that we think. There's also the two serogroup B vaccines as well. But the regular meningococcal the, that covers four different serotypes, that one, there's Menveo and there is Menactra. Those are the two mm -hmm. uh, brand names for the conjugates. There was a Menimmune, was a, the polysaccharide version. But again, polysaccharide, not as good of a response. So I believe they've taken it off the market, which is good. That was the one you had to give sub-Q, and it was a pain. Yeah. I, we, not I've, too many adult sub-Q vaccines anymore, yeah. are there? Mm -mm. Everything's I am. It's so, yeah, Zostavax is still obviously sub Q, and the MMR and Varicella is the yeah. only ones. Most live things are sub Q. Yeah. But yeah, those you're talking about cover serogroups A, C, W, and Y. Yeah. And then there's the serogroup B as well that you can get. Um, not but, as high of recommendations um, as the other one, but still recommended as a as an add on. Those would be Bexero and Tremenba. Tremenba. Tr not Tremenda, Tremenba would yeah. be. Anything you want to add about those? Set two. No, that's not it. Yeah, they'll recommend those in adolescents, eleven and twelve years old, uh, with a booster at sixteen, and then obviously as adults in certain situations. Anything else? Any other? I'm sure there's a couple other ones we could go through, but man, we really that was a lot of vaccines. There yeah, a lot of immunizations. They're amazing things, and there's controversy surrounding them, but um, seems primarily unsubstantiated. Yeah. Um, couple things to uh, real quick to kind of just clean up um, vaccine needle size if you're giving an IM injection we typically use a one inch needle mm -hmm. right yep. um, but if you look at the CDC's guidelines they actually say that if a, if a male patient is greater than 260 pounds um, they should be using a one and a half inch needle mm. and if it's a female that's greater than 200 pounds to use a one and a half inch needle that almost never actually happens I was gonna say that does um, not happen does it but it's That's in the actual CDC recommendation, so make sure that you're at least aware of that. One and a half inches, man! If you pull that thing out, mm -hmm. I got it. I forget who we ordered it for or what they were actually taking, but it was a two inch needle. Ooh. It looked like a sword. <laughs> it was a oh samurai katana that this person had to inject something with. It was ridiculous. I mean, you can feel you can. I mean, you can feel it hitting the muscle when it goes into the muscle, um, which always makes you feel a little better. That okay, I, I, I went far enough. Um, but yeah, I guess that 
If I don't hit that. bone, I don't, I right. don't, I don't count it. <laughs> didn't do it right. <laughs> yeah, you could get a longer needle. <laughs> right. If they didn't, uh, didn't scoot him over a foot, then you, exactly. you didn't hit him hard enough. <laughs> but um, sub Q, we're looking at a five eighths inch needle. No reason to go up with yeah. that one. Yeah. Um, and then as far as when to give the vaccines, because there's some people that will freak out about giving too many vaccines at once. Um, so the CDC, ACIP, they do not recommend a specific like max number that you can get. So if you get, let's say, flu and pneumonia today, tomorrow you come back and you want uh, meningococcal, that's fine. You don't have to wait a certain amount of time. Um, where it gets a little confusing is the live vaccines. So it is okay to get two different live vaccines. So you can get, for instance, like varicella and MMR in the same visit at the same time. However, if I get MMR and then I leave and I go home and then I go back to the clinic later on that day, it's not the same visit, it's not the same time that I'm administering the vaccine, I have to wait four weeks to actually get the vaccine. Do you have a reason for that? Um, I guess because it can affect your immune response yeah. to the second vaccine when like you, you give two different lives. Yeah. Um, so if you give them at the same time, because that was the thing that was, I've, I've actually watched someone get turned away from getting varicella and MMR um, because the f- pharmacist didn't think that they could give two live vaccines, but they make ProQuad, which is all, right. both of those put together. You can give two of them at the same visit at the same time. That's okay. Just if they come back and they're like, I had uh, varicella yesterday, I need MMR today. They got to wait right. the four weeks. Right. Um, and then also if they're having a PPD placed, they're mm-hmm. having a, um, a TB test, um, it can mess with the results. So if you get a live vaccine, you should wait four weeks before you have a PPD placed. That's the other thing. Gotcha. Or just get the PPD first, wait 72 hours, have it read, then get your live vaccine. You're good Make to go. Make things easier. Yeah. So it can, can cause a false negative if you get a uh, TB test right after a live vaccine. A couple of things, fun facts. There you go. All right. Well, set two. I do have a couple things to add. I would love you to add. Throw them in there. Um, So one of the things that makes it very difficult um, sometimes is to keep track of what vaccinations to give when, all of that, Um, especially it's like time going back to school. I know we were talking about adult vaccines, but it just in general to keep track of a lot of these vaccinations, there are some really cool apps that are really useful that I think um, that would be helpful for healthcare professionals as well as parents to be able to refer to. So CDC just has a really great app um, that basically has all the schedules on there, which could be a great reference while on the job um, for healthcare professionals especially. But the app that I really like is um, some called so this is an iPhone app and it's completely free. It's called Vax, uh, Vaccines Education Center app. And so the advantage of it is that if you look at a specific age and then you put in a specific time frame, it actually gives you like a schedule and it pops up on your phone saying like, hey, it's time to get this vaccine or something. It's kind of like a cool reminder. Uh, and then there is another um, app called Vaccine Tracker app. And it does similar thing where you can actually have multiple family members in there and you can put an age and it gives you also like a reminder. And so this could be a really cool tool for um, people to use when they're trying to keep track of all the vaccinations. Yeah. And even for elderly members, you know, like it's just sometimes hard to keep track with everything. Yeah, so. People with seven kids, I'm sure they rely on the pediatrician, but it's probably hard for them to jumble all the different kids and figure out what yeah. the schedule is. No, that's good. That's really cool. I haven't seen that one myself. That's good. Awesome. What else? Anything else? Um, that's about it. That's about it? Yeah. Well, we really appreciate you being here with us. Thank you it's, for having uh, me. It's a Sunday afternoon, and she was off today, so it's yes. cool that you're, we appreciate you spending your time. Um, Cole, anything else for you, man? No. I guess I can mention that um, frequently the recommendation is to give it sitting, give immunization sitting down because people can faint, have a vasovagal response. Um, and they also say, you know, keep an eye on them for about 10 to 15 minutes doesn't always happen, especially in the pharmacy, because people like just waltz off. Um, but, you know, you can mention if you start feeling bad, let mm-hmm. us know or whatever. So Yeah. And then you just kind of watch them. If you see, like, they're having problems, then you just shut the, the thing real quick so you don't get blamed for it. <laughs> right. I think that's the key. Oh, jeez. That's a joke. 
<laughs> just joshing just joshing all right well thank you guys so much for listening again um you know with us hitting the twenty thousand mark this this week we, we're very grateful for anyone who takes the time to listen to the podcast yeah, absolutely um we really appreciate it if you have any questions please reach out to us uh, we're on all the social media platforms uh if you enjoy the podcast um, definitely give us a comment or at least a rating that would help us out and if you um watch online and you like the youtube videos definitely subscribe to our channel Um, We will see you guys next time. Have a good one.